Hey guys, so um, it's been a minute. Uh, I got a prophecy on 4 9 24, two days after I had got the last one. But then I've been getting like a fire hose of additional uh, prophecies and dreams that I've been keeping up with. And some of those have had projects given to me or like this one has a project on it. So you'll understand once they all start coming out why it's been taking so long. But I'm back and there's going to be a video hopefully every day, every you know, maybe every couple days depending. Um, my life is insane as we all know. But my husband did get sick again and he is on IVs again at home. And then I also have a Bible study that's new. And so I've just kind of got a lot of things going on besides the normal. So I'm going to get these out as fast as possible. But uh, I am running a little behind usual pace. <laughs> okay, so let's get going on this one because it's going to be long. Majesty. Majesty, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The whole earth is to rejoice. The birds and beasts will sing. The rocks will cry out. The men will bow down. Christ, the Son of the living God, will be honored. The days are short until this event. All who are mine look forward to this event. In my grace, I extend a little more time for those who have not had the humility to come. I will display my full miracles, things never seen. The whole world will have a chance to choose me. Any that stay for the great tribulation are stubborn of heart. The events to come that are evil will be very difficult. My own will have superseding miracles. All will see what the God of the universe is about. Love, protection, and provisions. I will shower mine with mercy through the evil before the rapture. Men will have ample opportunity to see my majesty. Those who are stubborn will be shamed. The shame will begin with those who call themselves my leaders, but instead report to man. Ailments, losses, destructions will be their public shame. My true ones who are filled with faith will be healthy unharmed, silent, and provided for in each trial set up by man that I will use to sort out the wheat from the tares. The church will be sorted before the rapture. Observe who falls, pray for them. Pray they humble themselves before me. Pray their chains to this world and to the things they place before me are broken and their hearts are softened so they can approach me in honor with humility and full faith and obedience. When the sorting is done, strange things will be seen. Those full of faith will boldly stand for me and I will rain down miracles. After the chaos and bombs stop, the world will be in a state of confusion and unstable. They will be looking for foundations and truth. My true church is filled with faith and miracles. It will go forth in boldness and they will share in truth that my one and only son, Jesus Christ, is the one and only Messiah and he came to live a humble, sinless life on earth to be a physical sacrifice to all who believe in him, to have a pathway to be forgiven and have eternal life. Those who hear this good news and believe it and are baptized will be redeemed and raptured before the tribulation. Many will come after the evil and horrors of man are seen, contrasted with the mighty grace and protections and provisions seen for my people. There will be no doubt I am the living and eternal God. The wicked will not like that I provide for my own. In their bitterness for not having my protections, their natural consequences do. And for their commitment to the system of the Antichrist, they will villainize my people. It will occur quickly, but I will spare my people before it is too late. There was an earthquake a number of years ago. When those in charge were angry with what had happened, they blamed me and those who loved me for the event. This displaced anger will reoccur 
and it will be similar in nature. Be bold. I will not allow any harm to come to any of mine in full faith that are sharing the gospel and praying in faith. Not one hair on their head will be harmed. No matter how grave it may appear, have faith. Rejoice. This is the 70th year, the year of release. No one can stop what is coming. No one can avoid what is coming. Everyone can avoid the great tribulation by coming to me. Now, I'm supposed to tell you that the year of release, it said this is the year of release. That can mean this, like like 2024, or that can mean the 70th year as if God is looking at a calendar that we can't see and he's pointing at it and he's like, see this one, this is the one. So we're going to be patient. We're not going to pick dates and we are not going to freak out at those words, okay? We're going to wait patiently and gratefully be thankful for the road signs we're being given and understand that when these things occur, that is indeed the 70th year, the year of release, okay? Now, right here, I'm supposed to tell you about that earthquake that was referenced. It's called the Libsyn Earthquake of 1755. Okay, so to tell the story, I have to prep some background information to make all of this more understandable and to save time. So this event for us, because we're so far detached from the time period, is kind of like coming into a soap opera mid-story. So I'm going to summarize the drama and make it real understandable. And um, I want you to hang on until the end because there are some significant um, parallels that will happen for us pre-rapture. Okay, so here's the background information. We have the main characters, which are Joseph the First, King of Portugal from 1750 to 1777. His other name, aka Jose, Francisco, Antonio, Ignacio, Norberto, um, Augustino. Okay, so he was a devoted Catholic. He developed the port wine industry. He loved his jewels, gold imported from his province in Brazil. He loved the Lux life so much that he deferred his duties to the Secretary of State for Portugal. So let's look at the next guy, Milo. Milo is the Secretary of State in 1750 to 1777. Um, he was also called His Excellency or the Marquis of Pomel. Um, and then his name, Sebastião José de Carvelo e Milo. Now, he was favored by the king. He lived in a large, advanced, progressive cities before he came to this job. And he felt Portugal was an embarrassment and behind the times. Um, he was a firm adversary of the Catholic Church, especially the Jesuits. He was against all men who, who he felt represented God because he was godless and embraced humanism and the Enlightenment movement. His goals were to change society to be more sophisticated and to adopt the modern philosophies of the Enlightenment. His goal was to be famous in Europe. For five years before the Libsyn earthquake occurred, he was trying to have the Catholic Jesuits expelled from his country legally under the rules of the Inquisition for issues they had done in some of Portugal's South American provinces under the guise of mission work. He ruled with a strong hand and he imposed strict rules on all classes of people. He was unpopular with many that he ruled over, especially the aristocracy. He also had a lower middle class uprising against him before this earthquake that was very bloody. And he was in a power struggle with the aristocracy the year of the earthquake to remain in power. All right, the next guy is Malagrida. He was an Italian Jesuit. He was a Jesuit missionary to Brazil for 28 years. He was an influential member of the Portuguese royal court in 1753, appointed by the Austrian-born Queen of Portugal. Um, Milo, remember the last guy, detested Malagrida um, being on the royal court, and he accused him of high treason for crimes in Brazil. But since he was clergy, he could not be tried anywhere but the church and he had to go through the inquisition process when he went through the inquisition process he was pronounced innocent he was a sebastianist 
Now, in that time, these believed that King Sebastian of Portugal, who disappeared or died in 1578, they believed that he would come back to life. And on that day, the millennial kingdom of Christ would occur. These Sebastianists used this prophecy to convert many people to Sebastianism. The Jesuits. Um, they have other names like the Society of Jesus and the Jesuit Order. They were founded just before the Council of Trent in 1545 to 1563. If you're not sure what that Council of Trent is, it's a Catholic ecumenical council prompted by the Protestant Reformation. Some have called this the Counter-Reformation to condemn the doctrines of Protestantism and to defend the Catholic doctrine. The Jesuits were focused as a religious order of priests or monks primarily devoted to contemplation and solemn celebration of the liturgy founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola in Spain, which created a guidebook of spiritual exercises which were to spend in 30 days of isolation each week with a different focus on foundation, purgation, illumination, or union, and this was coined the Ignatius Spirituality. The Jesuits became known for being missionaries, doing charitable work, and educating others into Catholicism. By the time of this earthquake, there were about 1,000 Jesuits working in Europe, Asia, Africa, and what is now America. The Jesuits established 74 colleges on three continents and incorporated the teachings of Renaissance humanism through the lens of Catholic thought. These universities brought forth many of the important thinkers that brought about the scientific revolution that killed faith and elevated rational, provable reason. Five years after their origin, the Jesuits began to be accused of being deceivers, atheists, heathens, spreading falsehoods. They were staunchly against the Protestants and at that time the Freemasons. By the 1800s, when Albert Pike, a well-known Harvard graduate, author, attorney, and Arkansas Supreme Court judge, and Confederate States Army General, and prominent Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite Freemasons, Southern Jurisdiction, Pike published his famed work of art called Morals and Dogma, in which he laid out why the Freemasons were the royal lineage to be the Knight Templar. Those who were opposed to Pike's claims rebutted that the Templars, who were not intelligent enough to be the Knight Templar, as they stated that the Jesuits were the true bloodline to the Knights Templar. So why do we care about that? The Knights Templar are a military order of the Catholic Church, headquartered in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem for two centuries during the Middle Ages. They led the Crusades, and have symbology in many modern day elements, movies, buildings, etc. The secret conspiracy is that these preserve the bloodline of Jesus himself. I highly doubt that. The most Christians in our day know that masonry is deeply involved in the occult. Few Christians in our day know that there is an identical reputation for the Jesuits. The Catholic Church, of course, emphatically denies this. The intelligentsia. College-educated men that had a status called the intelligentsia were known for complex mental labors that shaped politics in various countries of that time. They were employed as teachers, professors, journalists, and literary writers. They were often employed by the royal courts of their kingdoms and touted as being cultured and they had much influence in shaping government policy. Voltaire, the Enlightenment philosopher. Um, his real name was like Francois-Marie Arrette, or Arouette, something like that. A member of the intelligentsia from France, he hated the monarch demands that everyone was to be Catholic since he was a humanist. He felt like England, um, various regions, he felt like England had a good idea that various regions should be able to live together in society tolerably and not have to be the same religion. 
He believed no religion had any true power and that with the rational mind, men should be able to problem solve and work out their own issues, having autonomy, not authoritarianism from monar monarchies. From monarchies. He preached that great freedoms and great tolerance were both critical to happier, more productive citizens. He was a huge critic of the Catholic Church and a huge critic of slavery, which France was heavily involved in at this time. He felt all religion was propaganda and did not believe in faith or God, but he did believe there was some form of higher intelligence or supreme being. He was one who was pressing for freedom of speech, freedom of religion, democracy over monarchy. He met Benjamin Franklin, who convinced him that he should be a Freemason because he held all the same views and core beliefs as the Masons. Voltaire became a Mason and promptly died one month later. Sanchez, a Jewish philosopher. Um, his name, Antonio Nunez Ribeiro Sanchez. Portuguese physician, philosopher, encyclopedia author, humanist, and very influential in the Portuguese intelligentsia. Jewish, but then forcibly became baptized as a, quote, new Christian in the Portuguese inquisitions, rumored to be secretly practicing Judaism. After being targeted as a Jew, he fled to London, then various cities in Europe until he find, finally ended up in Russia as the court's physician for the Empress Anna of Russia. He stayed there until successive Empress Elizabeth Petrona, so he moved to Paris to do the same job, and eventually Catherine the Great rewarded him a great pension. The Spanish Inquisition. So another name for that is the Tribunal of the Office of Inquisition. This was established in 1478 by the Catholic monarch King Ferdinand II and Queen Isabella I. Um, it was intended to maintain Catholic orthodoxy in their kingdoms and to replace the medieval inquisitions, which were under papal control or the Pope's control. The Spanish Inquisition manifested into a wider Catholic Inquisition, Roman Inquisition, and Portuguese Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition triggered a strong wave of immigration of Catholic heretics and Jews and Moors, Moors are basically Muslims, in nearby Portugal. Their choice was to leave Spain or be burned to death on a stake of wood in the ground. The Spanish Inquisition spread past the Jews and the Moors to the Orthodox Catholics, which were considered heretics and involved in witchcraft or superstition, all who were blasphemous with verbal offenses and questions toward the clergy, all that had sexual immorality, sodomy, anyone who questioned the Virgin Mary's position, um, anyone who read prohibited books, anyone who was a Freemason. Until the 1730s, then Freemasonry joined the Catholic Church um, but we'll keep going. Bigamy, marriage between two who could not procreate, crimes illegal by the government, like murder, theft, etc. All of those things. If any of those things occurred, you would have to go in front of the Spanish Inquisition. So the next one is the Portuguese Inquisition. Okay, established in 1478 by the Pope Sixtus IV intended to maintain Catholic orthodoxy in their kingdom and replace the medieval inquisition which was under the Pope's control. Before this, the Jews and the Moors lived in their own self-governing communities. After this, they were told to convert or leave, and if they did not leave, they were forcibly, forcibly baptized, and then they were called New Christians. Um, however, in the history of this time period, when a mob of Jews were headed to be mandatorily baptized, a mob who accused Jews of being the reason that their country had gone through a drought and famine, and the mob slaughtered the Jews, which caused the king to punish the mob, and renewing the rights to the Jews, giving them rights to not be questioned about their religious practices, and to leave for Portugal freely. 
But in 1531, Pope Clement VII, who granted Inquisition rights to persecute Jews, went back on his word and suspended the Inquisition and pardoned all the Jews. He created a true doctrine on the conversion of infidels and proclaimed the courts used for Inquisitions were ministers of Satan and acting like thieves or mercenaries. This stalled out the Inquisitions, but King John III of Portugal continued to insist and negotiate for his brother-in-law, Charles V, to reestablish the Inquisition. The major target of the Portuguese Inquisition were Jews that were baptized and called new Christians, but were accused of secretly practicing Judaism. There were other ethnicities and faiths also targeted in these like crypto Muslims, which are falsely converted for the sake of trade or survival, and those that relax their Sharia obligations. Africans from the slave trade who were accused of witchcraft, bigamy, and any who used divination were also targets of the Inquisition. All Saints Day in 1755. So, All Saints Day was a three-day holiday. On day two of a three-day holiday, together named All Hallowtide or All Hallow Time. Day one was October 31st, All Hallows Eve, Halloween. The day worshipers prepared by fasting, and then they had an evening vigil mass. There was a belief that the veils between our world and the spiritual realm was the thinnest on that night. Day two, November 1st, was All Saints Day, a solemn feast day to remember all the saints and martyrs, known or unknown. It was mandatory to go to church on this day unless you were on your deathbed. Day three, November 2nd, was called All Souls Day. The commemoration of all the faithful departed, prayers, alms, visiting cemeteries, praying for the poor souls in purgatory, and trying to gain them indulgences. Understanding the importance of this holiday to the Catholic culture at this time, everyone was in the city at the church when the earthquake hit for the Lipson earthquake of 1755. So let's understand this holiday a tiny bit more. Originally, these holidays were for the Catholic Church and they were in May until the 9th century when it was moved to November. In the 9th century, the, the Celtic areas in Portugal were doing an October 31st pagan festival for their god of winter called Sam Hain. Celtic Lord of Death. They believed the ghosts and the fairies and the goblins of the dead would come back on October 31st and prey upon or kidnap anyone who had previously harmed them. The Celts offered up animal and human sacrifices and read the remains of these burnt individuals and animals as a reading of the future for the following year. When the Catholics took over this area, they took over that holiday, integrating it into their festival. By the time of this earthquake, it was a well-established trio of mandatory attendance holidays. And this did not end until 1955 with Pope Pius XII and his liturgical reform. Uh, most Protestant branches of the tree have not partaken of this trifecta of holidays. Okay, so now we're going to dig into the Lipson earthquake of 1755, which happened on this All Saints Day. And all those different characters that I talked to you about and these different like names of titles of different jobs and stuff, they're going to come into play and I'll pop them up so it's not foreign information. Okay, so number one. On November 1st, 1755, All Saints Day, the city with about 200,000 people were all gathered in churches. Number two, 9.40 a.m. local time and an estimated 8.5, three and a half to five minute earthquake hit the epicenter in the Atlantic Ocean near Libson, Portugal, causing a 16-foot chasm to open up in the ground in Libsyn. Number three, 
Many buildings, including churches, collapsed, killing and injuring thousands. Ships at port lost their cargo, docks littered with mud. Survivors rushed to open spaces and to higher ground. Homes and candles burning for the dead for the holiday fell in the quake and burned the buildings, spreading fire-based destruction to most of the town. No one being home to put the fire out quickly. This included the libraries and businesses. It was such a massive fire that many people died from smoke asphyxiation. Number four, 40 minutes after the initial earthquake, a tsunami came into the town, flooding it about 20 feet high, as well as pushing up the Tigris River, the longest river in the peninsula, pushing destruction farther out into the country. People on horses were trying to escape. They could not even outrun the quick inflow of water. They had to race to higher ground. So many were drowned as well. Number five, this event was not isolated to Libsyn. No, damage in all the surrounding areas from England to Africa, as well as across the ocean from Brazil to Canada and all the islands in between within 10 hours when the associated reactive tsunami hit on our side, it was at a depth of 13 feet of water. Unfortunately, an estimated 60 to 90,000 people died in Libsyn alone, and in 85% of their buildings were destroyed. But in good news, this event triggered what we know today as the study of seismology, as well as the foundations we use for seismically safe building practices. The Libsyn quake had many religious, political, and societal repercussions that we need to learn from since history repeats. Here are the lessons. Number one, King Joe. King Joe escaped his palace and its destruction never to return to town due to a new fear of enclosed structures. He demanded a system of tents be built in the hills of Ahuga, where he lived until he died. Milo, immediately after the earthquake, he began organizing recovery and reconstruction. Reconstruction began one month later. He was saying, bury the dead and feed the living. People started looting what was left. Milo brought forth gallows and ordered 34 looters to be killed to make known that he was serious. He was a strict authoritarian in control. He also instituted what we call martial law to keep the peace for the cleanup and rebuild project. Rebuilding would be very costly with 85% of the city destroyed. So he saw a golden opportunity to reform the entire economy to reduce the dependence on Britain. A great time for a new currency with a new value. Milo could see this was a huge opportunity to rebuild Portugal to be a more sophisticated and enlightened, perhaps making him finally famous in Europe, his target goal. So the arts, statues, new signs, and more modern designs, as well as an anti-earthquake destruction technology was used in this rebuild in a land suited for the machine age. Within one year, the debris was all cleared and a perfectly ordered city with large central squares and wide avenues with wider streets were constructed with the new Libsyn mottos posted all over town. Number three, the great debates that shaped change. First, there was the Catholic clergy response. Since the earthquake hit on a Catholic holiday, there was much confusion and anxiety among the survivors. The Catholic clergy were telling everyone that this earthquake was the just consequence of a divine judgment from God for man's sinful ways. They were encouraging their parishioners to be very pious and reverent toward their deity. The intelligentsia saw this as exploiting a crisis for the advantage of manipulating the people into piousness. The Catholic Jesuit and Sebastianist view. There was a Jesuit Sebastianist who supposedly predicted the earthquake to occur on All Saints Day three years prior to this event. But this was hotly contested as being written after the event. They were converting many to Sebastianism with these words. The European philosophers, their viewpoint. 
They brought light to the fact that all the churches in Libsyn fell, but all the brothels remained standing. Therefore, if it were divine judgment, why would evil be left standing? Voltaire. Voltaire crafted one of his most famous poems about the event. The poem was very hopeless, challenging the providence of God with the evil produced by nature. He volunteered the idea that evil is real, and instead of understanding God, people need to focus on devoting their love and attention to the suffering within humanity. Sanchez. He felt the earthquake was of natural causes, vapors coming out from within the earth. Milo supported Sanchez's offers in the argument and published his argument and his efforts into a book. This book was ordered to be distributed to all public and religious officials in Portugal to help influence their views. Malagrida was outraged at Sanchez's viewpoint. He argued that the candles burning down houses were not a result of vapors, which was one of Sanchez's points in his book. Therefore, the entire event had to be a punishment from God. Number four, Milo cunningly seizes the opportunity. Seeing that Malagrida rejected his preferred Sanchezian narrative, he tries again to have Malagrida and all Jesuits expelled from the country and especially off of his royal court. Milo began an inquisition of sorts. He used two previously written prophecies from Malagrida as proof that he was a heretic. He reversed the designation, New Christian, that was placed on Jews. In a stroke of irony, he aimed at having those that enforced the horrific practice of burning Jews at the stake. He enforced that they themselves would die or be made to leave the country, giving him the freedom to create the new modern society that he preferred. Milo did fear this extreme target may make him unpopular with Europe's elite, so he published a justification for his efforts in French. Milo had his own brother replace the head inquisitor to assure the outcome was in his favor. Milo did indeed become famous in Europe, but not for his progressive ideas and leadership, architecture, or modern technology, no. He was known for killing the Jesuits. Then there is Sanchez. He was skeptical that Milo could get enough people on board to get rid of the Jesuits, but he was on board to help him try. Malagrida. Because Malagrida was clergy, Milo could not try him in a court of law, but only in a Catholic Inquisition. While awaiting trial, he and other accused Jesuits were imprisoned in a dungeon. The prisoners were in hard prison conditions for two and a half years. While in prison, he had a prophecy that in two months, which would be September 3rd, uh, Milo's life would end by the star Virgo plunging into him and causing many woes. But Milo lived another 27 years and did not die via star. Each effort at an inquisition, he stayed silent and he said Jesus told him this. In this time, Malagrida broke from the tough conditions and went into mental illness. He was eventually found guilty of heresy based on two transcripts of visions that he received, one regarding the Antichrist and another about Saint Anne, said to be the mother Mary's mother. He was ordered to be strangled to death in the town square. He was the last Jesuit to be killed. So let's get to the bottom of this. Was Malagrida a heretic? Yes. I had to go and look up old documents, get them translated, look into the whole thing because I wanted to know for myself. I don't want to see, read someone else's um, opinion, okay? So the Antichrist prophecy, this is what he uh, prophesied, uh, that the words were dictated to him by the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Antichrist was called another John. He would be the third John in his family. His grandfather would marry a fairy from hell, and then the Antichrist John would be born in the year 1920 in Milan. The Antichrist would be baptized by his mother, Mary, a nun, and the devil. His father was to be Satan himself. Saint Anne prophecy. 
This was also said to be dictated by the Blessed Virgin Mary. Anne and Mary were both given a pre-birth sanctification, he said. He claimed that Anne is so blessed that the Trinity itself is jealous of her and her vow to obedience, chastity, and to the Holy Ghost. Why would the Trinity be jealous? Whatever. He said that Anne was more pure than the Virgin Mary. He had a backstory for Anne that she lived in Jerusalem with 36 retired women and the carpenters and the disciples of Christ would come there. He said supposedly she only married out of obedience to God and her daughters um, were said to marry Nicodemus, St. Matthew, Joseph of Arimathea, and St. Peter's supposed successor, Liam's. He claimed that when Jesus was 12 years old and stayed in the temple speaking with the rabbis, he was actually visiting St. Anne who was dying. He also said Mary was divine and was immortal and infinitely eternal and almighty. He also declared Mary was the mother of God. Okay, so we can understand that they're going to call him a heretic because he is a heretic, okay? Was the Sebastian prophecy of the earthquake real or deception? The one that was supposedly three years before predicting this. Some references say the prophecy was given three years prior when the event occurred um, and it converted many. Others reference the prophecy was written after the fact and they went out with this fake prophecy to convert many. So this is unknown. Okay, so what does this mean for us? Let's start with this. I'm not a supporter of thinking that Catholics are Christians, okay? I do not parallel the Jesuit efforts at prophecy or even interpretation of how to employ a society to follow God. Um, but the parallels are quite similar as to a heavy-handed government with deep distaste for Christianity or morality. So given the opportunity, it is going to be taken to eradicate a group of people. We know from Revelation that the Christians will be aimed at, and we know that we are an irritant to the plans of the wicked. I think the parallels that I see that should be strongly considered are the order and quickness at which all of this happened. And this was in a time without the internet, without telephones. There's no way to get information around, okay? So an old school propaganda war was waged with a pen and look how fast this ha happened. November 1st, 1775 was the earthquake. Immediately after they bury the dead, feed the hungry. Um, within the first month, there is looting and martial law. December 4th, that's barely a month later, reconstruction begins aiming at a more modern progressive society. Sound familiar? December, at some point, 1755, Voltaire pens his poem and publishes it. Early 1756, the leader writes his rationale for expulsion of the Jesuits. Soon after, the new economic system, the new mottos are written around town, and humanism, the newest godless philosophy of the day, was integrated right into society. March 1758, the Jesuits are all in a dungeon. September 21st, 1761, Malagrida, the villain of their plans, finally dies by public hanging, and the others that were left were escorted right out of the country. So in a three years time, with no internet, no TV, normal shifted to a new world with new rules and free from their version of disagreeables that slowed their progress down. And then three years after that, they perform a public murder of their main villain from that group of people. I think the lesson is that many things will go crazy and wrong soon enough. And those with a cunning eye to change society to the new world order's gameplay will villainize those who say the judgments are from God, real or not. And the tides will turn very quickly, like in less than a month's time, perhaps against the group that they deem to be villains for if their god does this then they are not worthy to be in society like it is the fault of say the christians not the fault of those who sinned and brought it on that's my gut feeling there will additionally be in our case a little man who thinks that he is the messiah and he will offer promises and solutions that he will not bring to fruition, but he will get many to follow him for the free food and the promise of a better financial times and a peaceful world. 
the trigger will be released at breakneck speed toward all who do not support him or the falsehoods he speaks. Those rounded up for speaking against him will be the first examples to intimidate the others to join him. So that is the summary of what was referenced and the, the project I needed to um, get to you. And we have many more coming. So hang in there and I'll see you next time.